Today we are going to discuss latches. What that is, we'll get to momentarily. Now, so far we've been studying what is called combinational logic. And a combinational logic circuit is something that implements a logic function. So maybe we have an output uh, binary variable y, logic variable, and that is some function of a number of input binary logic variables a, b, c, and so on. So we've not only looked at the, you know, the mathematics, uh, so-called uh, switching algebra or Boolean algebra, uh, that defines this type of a function, but also how it can be implemented using logic operations like and or not. Uh, and then in the physical world, that would be implemented with gates. And we look at things like how we minimize the number of gates we need by using K maps or some other procedure to get, uh, obtain a, a minimized representation of that logic function. Now, in this lecture, we, we begin to study sequential logic. Sequential logic consists of essentially logic functions that cannot be written in this form, just y is equal to f of a, b, c, etc., but rather something that depends on a sequence of events. Or we could say a sequence of past inputs. And we'll build up this idea in this part of the course. So this is your typical computer or smartphone or whatever kind of uh, typical device that you would use in the real world. It would actually be something that would take some inputs and store some things in memory uh, and then do some operations and then produce, provide some output then take some more inputs. And so there would be a sequence of things going on. Uh, and what's central to this idea is the idea of memory. If we're going to do a sequence of events, uh, that only makes sense if we can remember what happened in the, the previous step in the sequence so that we can use that result in the, the next sequence. Otherwise, we would just have a series of disjoint combinational logic functions and they wouldn't be able to communicate with each other. Now, this procedure of uh, implementing memory is going to require some new types of circuits. Now, they're not, we're not going to need new types of logic gates. That they'll be sufficient, but we'll need to combine those in a way that will implement things like, as in this, this lecture, latches. And as the name implies, or just a latch, um, it's something that latches on to a, a bit value, you know, a binary variable, a one or a zero, and holds it so that we can use it in the future. Now, the key to the operation of these memory devices is that they must produce a bistable system. Bistable meaning it has two stable states. Really simple example of this would be a coin on a table. They got this coin here, and the coin could have heads up, or you could flip it over. And it could have tails up. So this is a bistable system. Uh, if you try to balance it on its edge, it's not going to be very stable, probably fall over, and it'll eventually show heads or tails. So these are the two stable states of it. Well, you can use this as a memory. right? If I want to remember that some particular logic value is uh, 1, then I can put the coin with heads up. That could represent 1. Tails could represent 0. We're going to make now, sequential logic not only requires memory, um, but it also makes use of combinational logic. So really, 
we want to be a little more precise, we could say sequential logic would be combinational logic plus memory. And actually some a few other things like counters to, to move the uh, sequential state of past inputs along and things like that. We'll see how this works out. Sequential logic systems can be analyzed with a formality we'll call the finite state machine. So this is kind of a, you could say a model of a sequential logic system. We're going to use a specific problem to motivate our development of latches and the idea of sequential logic. And that is the problem of a water tank and how we control the um, fill and drain cycles for a water tank. So let's sketch out this problem. Here we have a water tank. It's got a drain at the bottom. And then up here there's a there's a pump P and that pump can pump water into the water tank from some source. So for example, in many big cities, New York City is a particular example, many large buildings will have a water tank on the roof. And this allows it, because it's up on the roof, it's gravitationally can just flow down into the user's apartments or offices or whatever. Um, and even if the municipal water goes out for a while, then you've got this reservoir of water that you can draw from. And then when the water supply comes back on, well, then you can start to pump this and fill it back up. So it gives you, first of all, a little bit of immunity from any problems you might have with the water uh, supply, right? You've got a very tall building. It takes a lot, of, a lot of power to pump water up to the top roof. Um, and it also then allows you to have your discharge water supply here uh, can exceed the ability to resupply that from the water source because you got a you know basically a reservoir of water here and you can drain that and produce provide a lot of water to your users and then when the demand is not so great it'll fill back up okay so let's imagine we have two levels a lower level and an upper level a higher level and on each of those we have a sensor and let's suppose this higher level the sensor is called H and it outputs a zero if the water level goes above this red line and a one if it goes below it so this sensor comes on if you drop below that water level and down here for the lower level we have the same thing sensor L outputs a zero if the water is above this level and outputs a one if it's below. So our goal is keep water level between the L and the H markers. And presumably what we would want to do is we would want to uh, Whenever we went below the low level, turn on the pump and fill it up. And as soon as we hit the high level, then turn the pump off. And you can let it drain and then cycle the pump in that way. Now, we might think about just using a single sensor. Could we use 
only the H sensor to do this. Right? If you go below the H level, H becomes 1, turn on the pump. When you go above, turn off the pump. Well, you can see a problem with that is you would be cycling your pump an awful lot. As soon as you hit that level, then you turn the pump off. And then as soon as somebody drains a little bit of water, you go below that level, right? Because it's just, in principle, anyway, uh, a point on the vertical axis. And so you'd be cycling. You would cycle the pump excessively. Of course, that would tend to burn out the pump, not be a very effective approach. So instead we have two target levels, an upper and a lower. Okay. It's kind of like the dipstick in your automobile engine. You know, you've got two dots and you try to keep the oil between those levels. Now let's analyze this system. If the water level goes above the H line uh, and the pump over here, Let's consider that a logic variable. If it's zero, then the pump's off. And if it's equal to one, then the pump's on. So if we're above the H level, definitely we want the pump to be off. No question about that. If we're below the L level, definitely we want the pump to be on. But what about if we're in between the H and the L levels? What should the pump value be? Not clear. Uh, if we had filled the tank and now we were draining it, we would want to leave the pump off until we got down below the L level. If we had been below the L level and we turned the pump on, we would want the pump to stay on until it fills up. So the value of the P logic variable in this region, when the sensors, right, H is 1 and L is 0, is not well defined. In other words, another way to think of that is that value of P for that range of sensor values will have to depend on the sequence of past events. If we were filling the tank, then we should leave P on equal to one. If we were draining the tank, we should leave P is equal to zero. We can make a, a truth table. Here's the L sensor output. Here's the H sensor output. And then here is the P logic function. Okay, so let's just uh, sketch this out. If they're both zero, right, zero is when you're above the sensor, then you're up here in this region above the H level and P should definitely be equal to zero. Let's put in the case where they're one, one, that's where we're down here. We're below both of the levels, so definitely we want P to be on. Now, the question is, how about if L is 0 and H is 1, right? So we're above the L level and below the H level. Well, we don't know. It depends, is the answer. And by the way, 1, 0, where we're below the L level and above the H level is impossible. All right, so this would be a don't care in our logic function because it can never happen. Our problem is this right here. So what are we gonna do? So this tells us that the pump state cannot be a logic function, a, a combination of logic function of the sensor outputs. It must depend on the sequence of events. Okay, and so it's going to also require then, right, so from what we just said before, we need to know whether we're coming from the state where H and L are both 1 and the pump was on, or from the state where H and L were both 0 and the pump was off. And we would say something like, if we are coming from this upper state where the tank was full and we get into this region, then leave the pump off. If we're coming from this lower state we're, where we're filling the tank and we get into this region, then leave the pump on. So again, this requires memory. We have to know what state we were coming from. 
Now, this is a one-bit memory is all we require, right? We could have uh, some logic variable m, say, and that would be 1 if we were coming from the, the filling state, the lower state, and we were filling, and it could be 0 if we're coming from the upper state. So we know we're going to require memory, but uh, how? How do we actually implement that memory? Our solution is called an S R latch set reset latch. The S for set, the R for reset. And here's an implementation. We have a NOR gate. Here and another one down here. And these outputs we're going to call Q and QN. First input to the upper NOR gate is going to be R, and the second input to the lower NOR gate is going to be S. Now, here's a key, a thing we haven't done before. We're going to have feedback. We're going to take this Q output, and we're going to feed it in to be the first input of the second NOR gate. And we're going to take this QN output, and we're going to feed it back to be, let me do it a little different here, second input of the top gate. So that is our SR latch. Now what does it do? Well, let's analyze that. Okay, so as I mentioned previously, um, this is this new concept of feedback where, we, where an output essentially becomes an input. And it's this feedback that's going to make this system bistable. So let's analyze it here. Let's write the logic function for Q. What is Q? Well, Q is the output of a NOR gate. So it is, what's the first input? It's R. And the second input is QN. And then we negate that. So it's a NOR operation. How about QN? That's a NOR gate. We have one input, which is the S, the set signal. Or uh, the other signal is the Q. And then we negate that, so it's a NOR operation. Now, let's, in this first equation, we've got QN, and here's the expression for QN, so let's substitute that in. So Q is equal, then, to the NOR operation between R and QN, which itself is the NOR of S and Q. So you now see what the quirky thing about feedback is. Here's Q, and it's a function of Q. The output variable is a function of itself. We haven't come across that yet. That's the key to the operation of this latch that makes it a bistable system. Let's do the same thing for QN down here. So this is the NOR operation on inputs S and Q. OK, but here's Q. Q is also a NOR of R and QN. Okay, so again, QN is also a function of QN. Let's look at some special cases. If S is equal to R is equal to 0, so the set and reset signals are both 0, what is Q? Q is equal to R is 0. Or S or Q, well, that's going to be 0 or Q. We negate that and then negate the second or operation. Well, Q or 0 is just Q, and then that would be negated, so that'd be not Q. And then not Q or 0 is just not Q, so then you'd have not Q and then negate that. And so that would be equal to Q. 
Okay, so if S equals R is equal to zero, then Q is equal to Q. Well, but what's Q? Well, whatever it was. Whatever it was before, it's just going to stay there. This is the latching operation. In fact, we're going to call this the latch state. And how about for QN? Well, it's the same same thing. S is zero, or then we've got a NOR between R, which is zero, and QN. So this is just going to be QN inverted, so not QN or zero, which is not QN, and the not of that is just QN. So the Q and QN outputs will just remain the same in the latch state. Now let's consider what happens when S is equal to zero and R is equal to one. So since we said that S is a set signal and R is a reset signal, when they're both zero, we're not setting or resetting. Then we call that the latch state. That's the memory state where it just holds the current values of Q and QN. So this, S is equal to zero, R is equal to one. Supposedly, this would be a reset state. So let's see how that works. What is the value of Q in this case? Okay, so Q is the NOR operation on R. Okay, and R is one. So it's OR of R and S or Q negated. So the NOR of S and Q and s is zero q okay and then that's negated and this is negated so what is that equal to so q or zero is just q negate that so this is one or not q that's always equal to one right one or anything is always one and then you negate that so this becomes zero so q goes to zero how about for q n what do we get? For QN, we've got S, which is zero, or, and then R, which is one, or QN, that's negated and negated. Okay, one or anything is one, and then you negate that, that's zero. So zero or zero is zero, and negate that, and you get one. So in this is called the reset state. In the reset state, you set the Q output to zero and the QN output to one. So now let's consider what happens if S is equal to one and R is equal to zero. So we're gonna have Q, and what's the, the Q function is negation of R or the negation of S or Q, okay? So this is gonna be negation of, now R is zero or S is one or Q, okay, negate that and then negate the final or operation. So one or Q is always one and negate that you get a zero, zero or zero is always zero, negate that you get one. What happens for QN? Uh, the QN function is, is the same as the Q function, but we swap R and S and replace Q by QN. Okay, so this is gonna be one or zero or QN. Negate that and then negate the whole thing. So QN or zero is QN. Negate that, you get not QN. But then, or that with one, well, that's always one. One or anything is always one. And negate the one, and you get zero. And you get the opposite output that you got from the reset state. And we call this the set state. In the reset state, we set Q to zero. In the set state, we set it to one. And then QN is the inverse of whatever Q is. Now, finally, we have the state S is equal to 
1, and r is equal to 1. What happens in this state? Well, let's take a look. Okay, so we're going to have these logic functions now, and both r and s are 1. So we're going to have 1 or 1 or q, negate that and negate the whole thing. So 1 or q is always 1, negate that, you get 0. 1 or 0 is always 1, negate that, you get 0. Okay, how about for qn? Well, we can see it's going to be the same, same story. Because 1 or q is always 1, negate that, you get 0. 1 or 0 is always 1, negate that, you get 0. So you get 0, 0. And notice, if we look at the other states, um, where we set and reset here. If we set, uh, do the reset, where q is set to 0, well then qn is the inverse of that, the negation of that. You get 0 and 1. And in the set state, we set q is equal to 1, and qn is the negation. And then, of course, in the latch state, we just hold on to whatever values we set or reset. Uh, so why not just call qn just q prime? And here's the answer, because in this, this state here, they both go to 0. And that's why we use qn, because it's not exactly, you know, qn is not necessarily equal to just q prime, or not q. Okay, so let's make our truth table. Here is the s input, the r input. We've got the q output and the qn output. Okay, so let's list our values, 0 and 0. 0 and 1, 1 and 0, and 1 and 1. And here's the results we got. For the 0, 0, that's the latch state. Q is Q, and QN is QN. Okay, we call that the latch state. 0, 1, that's where R is equal to 1. We call that the reset state. Q goes to 0, and QN goes to 1. Call that reset. 1, 0, S is 1, that, we call that the set state, and Q is 1, and QN is 0. And 1, 1, uh, they're both 0, and we actually want to avoid that state. That's not useful for us. So, how is this a memory? Well, if I want to remember uh, a bit value of 1, then I can go into the set state that sets Q to be equal to 1, and then go into the latch state, and it holds the value of q and the value of qn. If I want to remember a bit value of 0, go into the reset state. That sets q to be equal to 0 and qn equal to 1. Then go into the latch state, and it will hold on to those values indefinitely. So this fourth row here is really not useful. We generally want to avoid that. Now let's see how we can solve our water tank problem using this latch. So this will be our water tank circuit. So here we go. Here's a NOR gate. There's another NOR gate. Got this feedback. And here's our reset input. We're going to put a NOT gate there and feed the H sensor output. So this is going to give us that our reset signal is going to be NOT H. And down here, for the set signal, we're just going to put the L sensor output. So S is equal to L. Here's our Q output, and we're going to set that equal to P. P is equal to Q. So let's see how this behaves. So let's make our truth table where, where S is equal to L and R is equal to not H. And then we'll put the value of P here, the P for the pump, which is just our Q output. All right, let's put our values 0, uh, 0, 
0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. So remember that that 1, 1, that is the avoid state. And the S, the Q output, which is P, is going to be going to be zero there. So the zero zero state, well, that's that's the latch state. So Q remains maintains its its a current value. So P will maintain its current value. Now S uh, is zero and and R is one. That's the reset state where P goes to zero because it's equal to Q. Q goes to zero and one zero that's the set state so p goes to one again this is a void now let's draw the same thing in terms of the l and h variables and it's just going to be the same table uh, with this r column inverted to become the h value okay so l h p so we'll have the same s column zero 0, 1, 1, and the R column will be 1, 0, 1, 0. 1, 0, 1, 0. Uh, and the value of P will be the same. P, 0, 1, 0. And this last one is the avoid state. So let's see how this thing works. Remember, we have these two water levels. And the sensors turn on if you drop below that water level. So L equals 1, we're below the L level. L equals 0, we're above it. H equals 0, we're above the H level. And H equals 1, we're below it. So let's see what happens if we're all the way, all the way down here below the lower level. So both H and L would be equal to 1. So this is H equal L equal to 1. When we're up here above the Above the H level, H is 0 and L is 0. So this is the H equals L equals 0. Let's look at those levels first. Let's do the first one. So they're both 0. What happens? The pump turns off. P goes to 0. Okay, so the, here we get P is equal to 0. How about they're both 1? It's down here. P is equal to 1. The pump turns on. Great. Now, what about in here? This is the region. H equals 1 and uh, L is equal to 0. So 0, 1, that's here. Well, that's the latch. P is equal to P. What does that mean? It means just keep P at the same value as it, as it was. So if we started up here where P is 0 and we were draining the tank, just let it continue to drain. But if we started down here where P is equal to 1 and we were filling the tank, when we get up here, just let it keep filling. Just do what you were doing before. So we only switch the value of P when we're either up here or down there and if we're down here and we turn P, P is equal to 1 turn the pump on we don't get a chance to switch it off till we get up here above the high line so indeed that solves our problem now by the, by the way what about this avoid uh, avoid that would be L equals 1 so we would be below the L line and H is 0 we would be above right the H line so this never happens so we don't have to take any steps to avoid that it just nature does it for us it never happens impossible unless possibly we had a some sort of problem with our sensors okay then that that would be another issue now this kind of memory device is a volatile memory device meaning Right, this, this holds on to its, if you were in the, the latch state here, L is 0, H is 1, corresponding to S is 0 and R is 0. We hold on to that Q value, keep it memorized. And, but what if we turn the power off? Well, now the, the logic gates, when they lose power, well, they lose all their logic levels. All their voltages just go to 0. So you lose your memory. That's why it's volatile. If the power goes off, then you lose that. What would you do to make this system work if you had a problem of, of a fuse blowing or a circuit breaker blowing or a power outage, uh, you would probably have to have some initialization to your circuit. Uh, and what you might do then is just if you're in P is equal to 1, 
that state, you're below the lower level, turn on the pump. If you're above, make sure it's off. And if you're in between, what you could do is then just uh, turn the pump on by default and fill up the tank. So, right, so that would take some extra circuitry for the initialization. Right now, we're just worried about the, the steady state operation of this system. So here we are in logic circuit, and this, here's our SR latch, and then we've added this NOT gate to the reset input, and that is now gonna, this toggle button, will output the value of the H sensor, and down here for the set input signal, that's the uh, out toggle button that's gonna represent the output of the L sensor. Let's get this running. Okay, so we start off with H is zero, L is zero. That means we're above both water levels. We're above the high level, so the tank is full and the pump should be off and the tank then can drain. It's gonna drain and the water level goes down below the H level and this, that sensor turns on, the pump stays off. So H is one, L is zero and the pump is off, P is zero. Then the water level continues to drop, finally goes below the lower level. So the output of that L sensor turns on and now the pump turns on. We're below the lower level, the water starts to rise. Now the L, Output goes to zero, we're above that L level. Notice now the pump is on, P is one. Before we had H is one, L is zero, and P was zero. Now we have H is one and L is zero and P is one. So this is clearly not a combination logic function. The value of this output does not simply depend on the current values of these inputs, but also on the sequence of events. So then we continue out, the water goes up, we go above the H level, and now we're back to a full tank, and then it starts to drain. So, see there again, H is one, L is zero, but now this is off. But if I do this sequence, now it stays on, okay? So that's the latching operation. This is our first sequential logic circuit. And we can think of this as a finite state machine. So let's talk about that. Let's consider situation when the pump is off, P is equal to zero, as a state, quote, state of our system. And the situation when the pump is on, P is equal to one, as another state of our system. These are the two states of our system, pump is off or pump is on. And now we're concerned with what causes us to transition from one state to the other. So let's remember our geometry of our problem. We've got two water levels, a high and a low water level, and two sensors. The H sensor outputs a value of zero when we're above the high water mark, and it outputs a value of one when we drop below that high water mark. The L sensor does the same thing for the low water level. L is zero when we're above the low water level, and L is one when we're below it. So. If we're in the P is equal to zero state, the pump is off, well, that's where we're draining. And we turn the pump on only when L goes to one. So we're gonna draw an arrow from the first state to the second here, and the arrow means that's the way the transition goes from P is equal to zero to P is equal to one. And then we're gonna put the trigger for that transition as a label onto this arrow. We're gonna say when L goes to one, then the P is equal to zero state goes to the P is equal to one state. Now, P is equal to one, that's where the pump turns on. Now, what causes us to transition to the P is equal to zero state? Pump is on, we're filling. It's only when we go above the high water mark when H goes to zero, that causes us transition up here. So we'll put that as a label. When H goes to zero, then we make a transition. Okay, so these are the two triggers for transitions between our states. Now, of course, let's say P is equal to zero. We're up here, H is zero and L is zero. We're up here, completely filled up the tank, and we've gone to, to P is equal to zero. Now, as the water starts to drop, we do have a transition here where H is equal, goes from zero to one, but we wanna keep in this P is equal to zero state. Now, we could just, say here, well, there's no transition when H goes to one, so, okay, we don't change states. Or alternately, if we wanted to be maybe a little more complete, 
we could write a transition from the state to the same state when H goes to 1. And likewise, down here when the pump is on, so we've gone down below the wa low water mark and the pump turns on. Now as the water starts to fill, then L is going to suddenly go to the zero value, but we want to keep the pump on until we get up above the H level, so we could put another quote transition down here, which is really not a transition in the sense we stay in the same state, but this is when L goes to zero. So if we're in the P is equal to zero state, two possible things can happen. The H sensor can go to uh, output a value of one, in which case that means we've dropped below the high water mark. We want to stay in the P is equal to zero state though in that case. Or the L sensor can transition uh, from zero to one and that tells us we want to transition from the pump off state to the pump on state. P is equal to zero to P is equal to one. Now in the P is equal to one state, two things can happen. The L sensor can go from zero to one but in that case, we want to stay in the pump on state and just continue to fill. We've gone above the lower uh, water mark and we want to just continue, oops, continue to fill from there. Or the H sensor can go from one to zero, output zero. In that case, we do want to transition now and turn the pump off. Okay, so that's a very simple two state, finite state machine. So we've developed the SR latch, and we've seen a useful application of that. And latches indeed are useful devices, and there are variations of the SR latch. One is called the S-bar, R-bar latch. And the bar notation is another way to write the uh, prime notation. It means the not operation. So S-bar is S-prime and R bar is R prime. So what does this, uh, this type of latch look like? It's the same geometry or layout as the SR latch, except we replace the NOR gates with NAND gates. So we'll have here NAND gates. Same idea with the feedback. And then we have the inputs here. And these will be the inverted S and R signals. And here's your Q and QN outputs. So let's see, what is Q? Q is the output of a not AND, a NAND gate. Right? And so it is, and what, what are its inputs? S prime and QN. Okay, so you do the AND of those and then you negate that. Now we can use De Morgan's law to represent that in a different form, right? Because De Morgan's law says, put it up here, the NAND operation can be considered as an OR operation with negated inputs. So NAND applied to A and B is the same as the OR applied to not A and not B. Okay, so this becomes then, using that De Morgan relationship, it would be S prime prime, which would be S, or QN prime. Now down here, QN, what is that? Now let's see, that's the output of a NAND gate with inputs R prime and Q. Okay, so again, using De Morgan, we got R prime prime is R, or Q prime.
So I'll sub substitute the expression for QN and end up here. We've got then S or the knot of QN and QN is the OR of R and Q prime. Let's see, and down here, then we've got R or Q prime, and here's Q. We use this expression here and negate that. S or not QN and negate the whole thing. Now we have another version of De Morgan's law for the NOR gate, right? So if we do A or B and negate that, that's the NOR operation. And we know that that is equal to the AND operation on the negated inputs. So we can use that over here to express this R or Q prime primed as this would become S or and then the AND of the negations of those. So that would be R prime AND Q prime prime, which would be Q. And then down here, likewise, this would be R or negate the S and it with the negation of the negation of QN. So QN double prime is just QN, double negation. So let's look at the uh, different cases. Um, let's take S prime is equal to R prime is equal to zero. Okay, and by the way, when we, we say that the input is S prime, we just mean that if this is zero, then we interpret the variable S to be one. Okay, and if this is one, we interpret the variable S to be zero. So for S prime is equal to R prime is equal to zero, which of course would mean that S is equal to R is equal to one. Uh, what is Q? So Q is S, which is one, or not R prime, uh, not R, R prime, not R, the zero, and Q. Okay, and so that's uh, S equal to one, because it's one or something. How about QN? So you got R, which is one, or, and not S is zero, and QN. Again, one or something is always one. Okay, so they're both the Q and QN outputs are one when S prime and R prime are both zero, corresponding to S and R both equal to one. Now let's consider S prime is equal to R prime is equal to one, right, which would be S is equal to R is equal to zero. Well then what are our Q and QN functions? See Q, is up here s which is zero or r prime which is one and q of course one and q is q q or zero is q and q n like what r is equal to zero or s prime is one and q n so that's equal to q n that clearly is a latch state Q and QN just maintain their current value. All right, let's try S prime is equal to zero and R prime is equal to one, which would correspond to S is one and R is zero. Q is S or R prime and Q, one or R prime, which is one and Q. Of course, that's equal to one because one or anything is equal to one. And then QN is R or S prime and QN. So that's R or S prime, which is zero and QN. And of course, that's equal to zero. That is the set state. We get Q is equal to one, QN is equal to zero. So we've got the latch state, the set state. This first guy up here, this, this, uh, this state is gonna be the avoid state. 
for the SR latch, the avoid state was when Q and QN were both zero. Here for the S bar, R bar latch, it's going to be where they're, they're both one. Okay, and now let's finally go to S prime is one, and R prime is equal to zero. Now that's when S is equal to zero and R is equal to one. Q is, let's see, remember, Q is S or R prime dot Q. So S is zero or R prime, which is zero, dot Q is going to be equal to zero. And QN, that is R or not S and QN. So R is one or not S, which is one, and QN, and that's going to be one, of course, one or anything. And that is going to be the reset state. Okay, so in terms of S prime and R prime, or S bar and R bar, uh, the Q and QN outputs are, so let's just go through all the possibilities, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Uh, so for 0, 0, uh, that was up, up here, uh, that was the, the avoid state. They both went to a value of 1. For 0, 1, here that was the, the set state, and Q was 1 and QN was 0. And for 1, 0, that was here, that was the reset state, and they took Q and QN or the, have the value 0 and 1. And then the first state we looked at, uh, actually the second state, sorry, uh, that's where when they're both s s prime and r prime are both one that was the latch state and that's where q remains q and qn remains qn so if we want to write this in terms of the non-primed variables the s and the r which would be the inverse of what the, what the inputs are to this this system could do that over here s r q and q n and we'll do a little bit of rearranging here um, let's do 0 0 0 1 uh, 1 0 and 1 1 rearranging because the states are going to be in a different order here. The first now is going to be the latch state. That's where these have been inverted. So that's where Q and QN just are latched. Their values are memorized. And 0, 1 is going to correspond to 1, 0, the reset state. And 1, 0 is going to correspond to 0, 1, the set state. Finally, one ones can correspond to zero zero, which is the avoid state. And if you look at that, that is just the SR latch truth table. So you can see what happens with the S bar, R bar latch. It gives you the same results as the SR latch, but where you're treating the inputs as the inverse of the S and the R variables. Now we're going to find that this is actually a very useful uh, device, and we're going to actually use it later to uh, actually construct a static random access memory cell or an SRAM cell. Previously, we've seen that it could be very useful to add an enable signal to a circuit so that the circuit only operates if the enable signal is high or equal to 1. So let's look at doing this with our SR latch. So we'll have an SR latch with enable. So let's draw our SR latch first. 
So we've got these NOR gates. We've got the feedback. This is our Q output, and this is our QN output. And this would normally be our reset input, and this would be our set input. But we're going to have those be the output of AND gates. And one of the inputs to those, both of those AND gates is going to be an enable signal. And then up here at the top, we're going to put our reset signal, and the bottom, our set signal. So the output of the top AND gate will be reset and enable, and the bottom AND gate will be set and enable. So let's see what happens. If the enable signal is equal to 1, then reset and enable is just equal to reset, and set and enable is just equal to set, because S and 1 is equal to S. Okay, so then this thing just operates as a normal SR latch. The key now is to look at what if E is equal to 0. Obviously, then, R and E is going to be the same as S and E, because anything and 0 is equal to 0. So they're both equal to 0. So what we get, then, is the behavior of an SR latch with both the set and the reset signals equal to 0. Well, what happens when S is equal to R is equal to 0? You get the latch state. So we can make a new truth table with three inputs now. The enable, the set, and the reset signals. And we got the same Q and QN outputs. If the enable signal is 0, we don't care what the set or reset signals are. We're in the latch state, and so Q remains Q, and QN remains QN. Now, if the set signal, uh, I'm sorry, if the, if the enable signal is 1, then it behaves as a normal SR latch. So we go through these values, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and we have, when you have S and R both 0, we're in the latch state. In the 0, 1 input case, we're in the reset state, so the outputs are 0 and 1. And in the 1, 0 case, we're in the set state, the outputs are 1, 0. And in the 1, 1 input case, that's the avoid situation, uh, they're both 0. All right, so when the enable signal is 1, it behaves just like a regular SR latch. If we set enable equal to 0 now, it stays latched, even if we put say S is 1 and R is 0, which would normally put it into the set state, or S is 0 and R is 1, which would put it into the reset state, the data cannot be changed unless the enable signal is equal to 1. That can be very useful. And we can do the same thing with the S bar, R bar latch. And in fact, a variation of that is going to lead to our next topic, which is a so-called D latch with enable. So we now turn to the D latch with enable. And here you can think of D as meaning data. So this is a variation of the S bar, R bar latch, and that is built around NAND gates. So let's draw the two NAND gates here. These will be our outputs, Q, and it would have been QN, but now we're going to see in this case the QN can never be equal to Q. It will always be the inverse, and so therefore it is truly Q prime. So we'll write it as Q prime. Here is our feedback. And this is our S prime input and our R prime. And those are generated by two additional NAND gates. So 
for which one of the inputs is an enable signal, and the other input is, or the S prime output is a D or data signal, and then we take that and invert it to get the input or the R prime output. Okay, so this is our D latch with enable. So let's first of all see what happens if E is equal to zero. Right, let's let's write this down here. S prime. What is S prime? S prime is it's a NAND gate, so it's D and E inverted. So not D and E. So down here, how about R prime? It's a NAND gate, and it's the inversion of not D and E. If E is equal to zero, well, what do we get here? D uh, or D prime, and zero is always zero, and then you invert that, and you get one. So S prime would be equal to R prime is equal to one, and that is the latch state. So if you do not have, if, you, if the enable signal is low to this, you stay in the latch state. Q remains Q and Q prime remains Q prime. If E is equal to one, then S prime is D and one is just D and then you negate that, so D prime. And down here, R prime, is not D and E, which is just not D, and then you invert that, you get not D inverted, which is just D. Now notice, we can never get the situation where R prime is equal to S prime is equal to zero. Because if E is equal to zero, they're both equal to one, and if E is equal to one, then one is D and the other is D prime. And so they can't both be zero because if one was zero, the other would be one. Okay. And this is that uh, avoid state where we would, where R and S are both equal to one, uh, which would cause QN to actually be the same as Q. Uh, and we can never get that state here. So indeed, this output we can label as Q prime. It will always be the inverse of the, the Q. We never get that state. Okay, so let's write a truth table here. S prime, R prime, Q and Q prime. Well, actually Q and let's, because we're gonna, we're gonna just put first the, the truth table just for the uh, S bar, R bar latch. And here were the values, zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. Uh, the last row is the latch state. And the first row is that avoid state where they're both equal to one. The next row is the set state. S is one, so S prime is zero. So we get one, zero. And the next row is the reset state, zero to one. Okay. Now with the S prime and the R prime generated by this input circuit, we're going to get a truth table that has enable and a data signal and then a Q and a Q prime. So when the enable is zero, this is what we set up here. Doesn't matter what D is, we're always in the latch state. So Q is Q and Q prime is Q prime. If the enable is equal to one and then the D can either be zero or it can be one. If the enable is one, and D is zero, then R prime is zero. And S prime is the inverse of that is one. So that's this row right here. So that's Q and Q, QN, which are now Q and Q prime are zero, one. If D is equal to one, then R prime is one and S prime is zero. That's this row, uh, I'm sorry, R prime is one and S prime is zero, that's this row right here, and Q is equal to one, Q prime is equal to zero. So that's our truth table. So notice what this, this does. If the enable is equal to zero, then we're in the latch state. 
if the enable is equal to one, notice we can never be in the latch state because S prime and R prime can never be equal. They always have to differ. One's D and the other's D prime. So if, if the enable is equal to one, then for D is equal to zero, the output becomes zero, the Q, and the Q prime is just the inverse of that. And D is equal to one, the output becomes one. In other words, the output becomes equal to the input data. And then we set the enable to zero and we latch that. So this is called the D latch. And we're going to give it a symbol. It's so important to us. Uh, we're going to give it a little box symbol here. Here's going to be D and Q and E and Q prime. Two inputs and two outputs. Uh, now, a different way that this is often represented, which maybe can be a little more uh, it's a little more obvious what's going on. We've got D and E, and we'll put Q and Q as outputs. So instead of saying we have two Q outputs, we'll have one Q output, and then we'll put a little inversion bubble, and then it's clear that this is Q prime. Okay, and here's D and E. Okay. So with uh, our design of the D latch, we can now use that to build an S RAM cell. S RAM stands for static random access memory. And here's how we do it. We've got our, uh, oops. Our D latch here, here's the D and the E inputs and the Q output. We don't need the Q prime output for this. The Q prime output then goes into as the input of a tri-state buffer. And its output we will call D out, output data. So remember the tri-state buffer, when this third input is high, then this thing just acts as a buffer. And this value is just asserted over here. If this third input is low, then this output just basically disconnects, goes into a high C state. Okay, the enable signal is going to be the output of an AND gate. And the inputs of that AND gate are going to be a signal S for select and a signal W for write. The input to the, uh, the D input of the D latch is going to be a data in signal. And then the select signal is going to go and drive this tri-state buffer. Okay, so here's what happens. If you have select and write are both 1, then E is 1. And that enables this D latch. And then we know that the input D value goes to the output Q value. And that was, so this DN would then be uh, asserted as the Q output here. And then if you have the enable go to zero, either by having the right go to zero or the select go to zero, then that value gets latched and, and it gets held uh, here and the Q then doesn't change even if the DN does change. Now if the select signal is high, then this output value is equal to the latched Q value here. And if the select signal goes low, then this output is disconnected and is in the high Z state. Okay, so this is a static RAM cell, extremely useful little device, and we can stack these up. Say if we have eight of them, then we can memorize eight bits, that's a byte. And then if we have an array of eight of those, that would be a number of different bytes that we could then select with different address signals, which we could use decoders, for example, then to select different columns of those stacks of eight bit arrays of these things, and we could make a random access memory.